This is Monday, December 23rd, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. A cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Rabbi Lawrence Baser. Welcome, Larry. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be here. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, may I ask when you were born? I was born April 28th, 1963. And where were you born? In Lynn, Massachusetts, though I grew up really in Connecticut, mm -hmm. in West Hartford and Wethersfield, Connecticut. And what community do you currently live? My family and I live in Framingham, Massachusetts. Your marital status? Uh, I've been married to Leslie Baser, mm -hmm. and we have uh, two children, Oren, who is 16, and Eliana, who is 14. And tell us what uh, life was like in Lynn and Connecticut growing up. Well, Lynn, I can't really speak to because I was there for all of, I think, 10 days to two <laughs> weeks. But uh, I grew up in, in uh -huh. Connecticut, uh, first in Weathers, really Weathersfield, Connecticut, mm -hmm. till the age, I think, fourth grade. And uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, it. Weathersfield is always famous that mm -hmm. uh, George Washington supposedly slept there. The house, and mm -hmm. who knows who he slept with, <laughs> but uh, uh, he was there. And uh, and then my family moved to West Hartford mm -hmm. in 1974, and I really enjoyed growing up there uh -huh. and went to high school there. And uh, what your parents do for a living? My father was in um, uh, retail, and my mother, before I was born, was a school teacher, mm -hmm. and then homemaker, and raised us. And then toward the uh, Toward the end, my parents opened up a, a store, a retail store of their own, uh, until my father died and my mother ran it and then went off to work in other jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, was there any uh, military background in your family? Uh, a little bit here and there, uh, mm -hmm. although my father, I think, did Army Reserve as a dental assistant during the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. That's all I sort of knew, knew very little from uh -huh. then. Uh, my I had one cousin, excuse me, a great uncle who I was very fond of, fond of, who actually served during World War II, uh, was in the Battle of the Bulge, liberated uh, uh, a concentration camp, and he was sort of my military war, you know, mm -hmm. hero of the family. Um, I had a, an uncle who was an army doctor, mm -hmm. I know some people that served in Vietnam here and there, but nothing as like long term. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was your great uncle's name? My great uncle's name was Bob um, uh, Swirsky, and he's mm -hmm. actually put wrote a book finally, and also did some taping. He lives down in the Bridgeport area. Oh, good for him! So, but uh, I always had this love of the military for some reason, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, being a soldier or flying planes or who who all those things as a kid. Mm -hmm. So it was something in me that I just always enjoyed. About the military. All right. So, where and when did you enter the military? So, uh, I, I have sort of an interesting background. I originally mm -hmm. wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I went to Connecticut College in New London, which is a private liberal arts college. I have mm -hmm. a BA in zoology, uh, and which is very different than being a, a rabbi in rabbinical studies. Mm -hmm. But uh, the funny sort of the way that things got going uh, when I was graduating, wasn't sure what I was going to do, and I signed up for the Peace Corps to do that for two years and figure things out. Uh, I had my physical at the Naval Sub Base in Groton, because mm -hmm. it was convenient. They did the physical. I got a letter once that I was a candidate for fighter pilot school. Nothing ever happened there. Mm -hmm. But then when I finally decided to become a rabbi, uh, I learned about something called the Chaplain Candidate Program which is a program for seminary, uh, seminary students in all faith groups, Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, Catholic, Protestant, where you get to join a branch of service as a commissioned officer. It's a direct commission. And from there, you get a, get a sense of what it is like to be a chaplain. Their goal is that you would like it and then go active duty or enter, minimally enter into reserves. So I was looking toward that. And mm -hmm. I originally applied to the Navy uh, chaplaincy program. I liked the uniforms. I thought it would be cool on aircraft carriers, etc. But I wasn't accepted uh, due to uh, some asthma issues when I uh -huh. was a child. 
was heartbroken, was told to apply to the, try another branch, and then I could always transfer in. Once mm -hmm. you're in the system, you're in the system. Uh -huh. So sure enough, I applied to the Army Chaplaincy Program, the Chaplain Candidate Program. I was accepted. I actually took my oath of office April 24th, 1989, in Jerusalem, Israel, where I was studying at the time at the U.S. Consulate. Mm. So uh, for me, it's very special that when I took my oath of office to become a commissioned officer, it was in Israel, even though technically mm -hmm. on American soil. Right. So, uh, so since 1989, and I never went to the Navy and uh -huh. State Army ever since. Uh -huh. So I started off as what the seminarian program for about six years. Which, uh, which was great. I had the opportunity to, uh, I went to basic officers um, chaplain training. Um, the joke, so the funny line there is, although you know we did all the training, like in basic training, to an extent, we were already officers. And when the drill sergeant would say, drop down and give me 10, they would have to go, drop down and give me 10, sir. <laughs> We were officers. <laughs> All right. So where was this? Um, that was actually at, uh, I did that at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh huh. And then I did some. It was a summer. It was more like a summer job type level where, like, another summer I was in Germany for six weeks. You know, learning about uh, medical mm -hmm. hospital hospital chaplaincy, and that was an incredible experience. I worked with a. Um, infantry uh, brigade down in Fort Benning. And then I did a unit of clinical pastoral education at Walter Reed. So that was my experience there. Wasn't sure if I was gonna go active duty. I was thinking about it. Um, I took about four years off from doing real active work. Uh, in, the, in the Army, I decided I really wanted to, to, to see about just straight being a pulpit rabbi, which I was down on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And the Army said, do you want to stay in or do you want to get out? And at that point, I made the decision to come back on and recommission now mm -hmm. as a full chaplain. Before I was still in a seminary position, I came in as a full uh, full chaplain as a first lieutenant, and that was 1995 or six. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I served two years as an Army Reserve chaplain uh, based down at Fort Bragg with the Special Warfare Center. And then after that, I wanted real sort of regular experience with soldiers all the time, just to be their chaplain. And I then switched over to the New York Army National Guard in 1999. I re, sort of, not recommissioned, but sort of transferred over into the, into the Guard. Mm -hmm. And I've been a Guardsman ever since. Tell us a little bit more about being a chaplain. It's, uh, it's something I'm very proud of. So mm -hmm. um, we're in, in sort of the, we're, all chaplains are direct commissioned. So we don't go to basic training unless you know, you're in another branch and transfer over. Um, we sit on what's called the personal or special staff to the commander of a unit, uh, which means really my boss is only the commander of the unit, or for me now it's the adjutant general of Massachusetts. But um, so we're an advisor to the commander about religious uh, affairs, uh, religious life, uh, moral and ethics for the unit, and that opportunity to really be a part of his or her team to find the, the welfare of our service members. Uh, what that means in practicality, one, yes, you could say run services. You now, as a mm -hmm. Jewish chaplain, I, I don't have a lot of Jewish soldiers, mm -hmm. whatever unit I was in. So I wasn't really doing that. But it was a lot of counseling, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is very important. It was someone that a service member can talk to that's outside of their chain of command. They're not, if they talk to their, you know, their sergeant ahead of them, above them, or a lieutenant to their captain, it's all on record. So if they're really struggling with something, the fear could say is, hey, you know, they're going to hold this against me when for promotion or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if I talk to the chaplain, we have confidentiality. And it meant that they can talk about issues that they were struggling with. Maybe they were upset with how they were being treated. Maybe something's going on at home that they, they just need, some, need to bend someone's ear. We're always called chaplain and not by our rank. Mm 
-hmm. So although now I carry the rank of current full colonel, I'm really chaplain, you know, with parentheses, Colonel Lawrence Baser. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone else is referred to by their rank. We're called chaplain because I could be a chaplain to a private and be a chaplain to the general. And the idea is that no matter what the rank, the rank doesn't get in the way. And I think mm -hmm. that's really important. The other, I think something that's very special for me is the fact that when they talk to me, I'm not just a clergy, their home priest or minister or rabbi. I'm someone who's wearing the same uniform that they're wearing. And for people looking to see, seek out the chaplain, that's crucial. I, in a sense, get the military life. If, they're, if their family is, you know, complaining that, you know, they're always at drill, they always had these army issues to do, they can talk, they know they can talk to me about it, and I will understand what they're saying more than just any clergy or any counselor or something like mm -hmm. that. So for me, that's very special. Uh, this opportunity to, and one of the other parts I love about being a chaplain is, and I tell, because I'm now very much on a supervisory level, that up and coming chaplains, seminarians like I was, that you're always gonna have an opportunity to address and represent your unit and who you are faith-wise to a whole community. So when there's a ceremony going on, there's usually an invocation, and a benediction. And in that ceremony, you know, the, the keynote, you know, it's always the general speaking mm -hmm. or the commander, or the, the MC, maybe one or two other people, and the chaplain. That's really special mm -hmm. and something to take with great pride mm -hmm. and awe. So it's, um, for me, it's really been uh, an incredible experience. The last thing I'll just throw out mm -hmm. what I think is special about being a chaplain is that I get to work with clergy of other faith groups and really learn about their traditions and their faith and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, as a Jewish chaplain in the guard and really in, in a whole armed forces, there's not a lot of rabbis. So I'm very much a representative of the Jewish faith to the military. And now being, you know, I'm, I'm only the second state chaplain for the message, uh, uh, for the state chaplain nationally, and I'm the first Jewish chaplain in the Massachusetts National Guard since the founding of the Guard in 1636. So for me, that's an incredible honor. There wasn't like a rabbi before me, there was just no National Guard. So the National mm -hmm. Guard, uh, uh, Massachusetts is the nation's first, started in, in 1636, and since then I am the first Jewish chaplain. Wow. And only the second Jewish chaplain for any state mm -hmm. chaplaincy. You mentioned earlier in the interview you were in Germany for um, hospital chaplain. Tell us a little more about that. So that was during my chaplain candidate experience. Mm -hmm. um, the commander of all the medical command in Europe was a Jewish chaplain who I knew and contacted him. So I was actually coming home from Israel mm -hmm. and that was my summer job. What I liked about that, instead of working at a camp or working somewhere else and you know the pay wasn't great, here I was getting a nice salary for, you know, as a second lieutenant, but, uh, and they, you know, they covered housing and travel. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible experience that I had to be in a country and actually as a very low ranking officer, be on a hospital chaplaincy, um, mm -hmm. senior chaplain and visited patients and talked to them. So training for me was really a wonderful experience. I got to be in Germany. It was uh, an interesting experience. Um, especially as a Jewish seminarian, mm -hmm. I, uh, with a couple of friends, went to visit um, uh, Dachau, the, mm -hmm. the uh, concentration camp outside of Munich. Uh, that was very, very powerful. Got a chance to meet just some of the people who lived in, you know, the Germans who were, you know, wonderful people to talk to. And mm -hmm. I met actually a theology student who was trying to really deal with how Ger what Germany did Nazi Germany did to the Jews during mm -hmm. the Holocaust and as a seminarian how do we reconcile that how do we you know change Germans Germans attitude and that was an incredible evening mm. that if I wasn't in Germany I never would have had so uh, it was a neat experience plus um, you know I was single at the time or whatever it was a great time just to travel and mm -hmm. be in Germany at that time wonderful so now we're back to 1994 you've just been recommissioned Mm -hmm. So tell us what happened next. So I started off, uh, so now I'm a full chaplain. 
uh, I was assigned to the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in school, which is at Fort Bragg. This is the training school for Green Berets, the uh, Army Special mm -hmm. Forces. Uh, somewhere around there on a base behind a fence was where Delta Force was, hanging out supposedly. I didn't have oh, any yeah. contact. <laughs> uh, I helped run services on the base. I was mm -hmm. only there for two week stints because mm -hmm. I was a reservist. Um, but a chance to meet people and, and uh, it was neat. I got a chance to go up on a plane and watch a hell, uh, airborne drop. Uh, I liked it. It was, it was a nice experience. But I found myself really wanting to have that connection with soldiers that I can call my own mm -hmm. all the time, not just part time. And so after two years of doing that, um, I came across a chaplain who was with the guard and I, uh, he recruited me into the New York Guard at that time. So that was now, by the time I recommissioned, it was, or changed over to the Guard, it was 1999. Okay. And through there, again, various ceremonies. I was with a brand new startup unit that was based in Brooklyn. Um, I worked a helicopter crash right before Thanksgiving. That was a real test mm. of uh, what it meant to really pastor to soldiers and families. And probably the most powerful um, and challenging part of my chaplaincy when I was with the uh, New York Guard was uh, I was at 9-11 on 9-11. So and for the time period afterwards worked, you know, as a Jewish chap as a chaplain to my soldiers and first responders at 9-11 mm -hmm. and was there on day one. Okay, so uh, where exactly were you when 9-11 took place? I was actually still home in Framing, in, at that point, Hopog, New York. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually all set and ready to start writing some sermons for the High Holy Days. And uh, like everyone else, had the news on, saw what was happening, and realizing my world and day mm. was going to change. And uh, grabbed some stuff and um, said goodbye to my family and drove into Lower East Side. I'm also on the side, I also do a law enforcement chaplaincy. Mm -hmm. And I'm a chaplain with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, at that time based out of New York. Mm -hmm. So I went in both sort of knowing that I was going to get called up for the Army and also do work with the FBI. And so I first came in under FBI. And then mm -hmm. that evening I checked into my unit. And so for the next number of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, here and there, and sometimes covering things at home. Uh, with my home congregation was, was doing that, was mm -hmm. working the aftermath of the attack. So uh, describe that overall period. It must have been hectic. It was hectic. Uh, I used to laugh that I did a lot of the overnight hour shifts. So I would work sort of from 8 p.m. to 8 in the morning. Come home, change, maybe take a quick shower, do something mm -hmm. at my synagogue, go back later on. So it was hectic. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a sense, very powerful. I had uh, one of the t things that really stood out for me was um, it was the Saturday night after the attack. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see the towers fall. I got there when they were already down, but mm -hmm. I remember looking down at one street right near one of the buildings. It was still up. It was uh, building four or five, not the towers, but mm -hmm. one of the other buildings engulfed in flames and I remember thinking I was looking into hell Wow! so something that really still lasts with me as an image mm -hmm. but it was now the Saturday night I was standing at what was really it was the at curb it was like the street curb mm -hmm. from where the street was and then where the the um, sort of the the area where the the walkways and everything to one of the towers I think it was the South Tower but it was one big pit. And um, just looking down into it, and a fire like lieutenant or captain came over to me, and we were talking, and he said, would you say a prayer you know, for me? And we talked a little bit, and I said, did you lose any of your uh, firefighters in there? And he said, no, but he pointed, and he said, I know about 10 guys that are in there right now that are, you know, been killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we talked, and I did a prayer, and I think we both had tears in our eyes. And it was uh, one of the things that really was the lasting impression for me, what it meant there is even in this utmost darkness, uh, 
that God's presence is still is still there mm-hmm. and can be there. And it was through the the interactions of the two of us that did not let the darkness win out, but light. And that was something that was very important for me. Mm-hmm. What I felt what it meant to be a chaplain. Mm-hmm. I meant to ask you earlier, what was your rank at the time? I was a captain. You are now a captain. Okay, thank you. So, so that was really mm-hmm. very, uh, uh, it was an important part of who I am and I think how I look at mm-hmm. things. And so that finished up. Uh, 2003, I got promoted along the way to major uh, and became the aviation brigade chaplain for the New York Army National Guard. And uh, from there, uh, 2003, I was going to be I was leaving my congregation. It was time mm-hmm. to move on. And I accepted a pulpit here at Temple Beth Shalom, S-H-O-L-O-M, mm-hmm. uh, and continued on with my uh, work in the Guard, transferred to the Massachusetts National Guard. Mm-hmm. And from there, started with the uh, 79th Troop Command as their chaplain. And then about two years later, I and and there we were really engaged with um, the war on terrorism. Mm-hmm. And so there was one point when I was actually w- was going to be mobilized to Iraq, but I was actually I announced it just to the senior leadership, and then they pulled it. They mm-hmm. it was a chaplain who was going on medical leave who got himself cleared. He returned to the unit. So for a long weekend, it was a very rough weekend until I was. Uh So that was done. Uh, But my job, and then very soon afterward, the state chaplain at the time was leaving. There was no one above me, and I ended up being the acting state chaplain, two ranks below what normally is a state chaplain, which is a colonel. I was a major at the time, again, a major. And I was the acting state chaplain. And then it became my job to start mobilizing people when we needed deployments. So here I am sending people and, uh, and those issues. So, and being you know, the advisor now to the adjutant general. Um, went along there, got promoted to lieutenant colonel, mm-hmm. um, all the different things that taking part in the global war on terrorism, um, doing family retreat workshops to help with deployment and stress, uh, counseling, the hardest part that is a chaplain we do and that I would get one of the first phone calls is during a death notification when one of our fallen soldiers, uh, it could be even not part of the war on terrorism, uh, either in Afghanistan or Iraq, but many were to then go in to be part of the team that notifies a family. I think mm-hmm. it's the most sacred work that we as chaplains do. And I've done, I did one on Mother's Day, which was extremely hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was there when we lost our first soldier in the global war on terrorism uh, at, that, at that family. And so, again, very, very important parts of what chaplains do. I then, uh, so I'm a lieutenant colonel, I'm the state chaplain now fully because I now have the, the proper rank at least mm-hmm. to serve in the role. And then come around 2011, 10, 11, um, one of our major brigade units was was being called up, the 26th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade. The nickname is the Yankee Brigade. Mm -hmm. Um, A quick aside, the Yankee Brigade comes out of the tradition of the 26th Yankee Division, which was the famous New England and Mm Massachusetts-based Army Division that was here uh, in the 90s. It was uh, disbanded. um, Mm -hmm. And uh, they reconstituted as the 26th Yankee Brigade and with wearing the famous uh, whitey mm-hmm. patch. Yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, they were, the, it was a major unit going over. It was going to be commanded by uh, then Colonel uh, Jack Hammond, who, was, who in Afghanistan became Brigadier, got a one star, mm-hmm. Brigadier General Hammond, uh, and needed a senior chaplain for that role. And originally, uh, so they, uh, they wanted me to take that role because they needed someone senior to do it. And I was going to do six months of it, of the deployment, and then my full-time support chaplain would take the other six. So we were going to split the deployment uh-huh. because to pull a chaplain out long-term. And some other people were doing that, so there was that. So uh, broached it with my family, with my 
congregation. They were sad but supportive. Uh, and so I was going to do the first half during their initial part of their training down in Texas and then off to Afghanistan to Kabul. And um, so come finished up in February in January 2011 with my congregation and started the deploy the real deployment process uh, both here in, in Massachusetts and then we were leaving mid-February. And so I had one of the how should I say, interesting, you know, uh, uh, life moments that things change when you least expect it is, uh, so I have, I'm also now left being state chaplain, mm -hmm. and I'm now with the brigade, doing all my training and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a big goodbye cel uh, cere uh, celebration, you know, good goodbye uh, service and ceremony from my congregation on that Saturday. Um, like the 8th or 9th. Tuesday night, finishing up all my training. For the day, I come home. I was sleeping at home most of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was coming into the house. We just had a bad snowstorm. and Or one of the many snowstorms that, yes. that winter. <laughs> a lot of snow on the roof. And uh, we were going to have someone come and take off the snow off the roof. I wasn't going to do it, but someone was going to do it. And... I just, you know, I decided a quick moment, oh, let me just see how much snow is on the roof. I was going to look out. And I get out of my, I get my car, and I was actually, uh, at that point, I was, uh, I had a lease car. I turned in the lease. I was using my brother-in-law's car because, you know, I wasn't going to yeah. need it. I had uh, grabbed my backpack, and I had a bag, and I went to go look, and I'm climbing, and there's a little, like, thing of snow, whatever, and I step on it. And I guess at the end was just a big hunk of ice. And one of my boots caught and the other part, and I went flying and I broke my my left ankle. Ah. And there I am on the ground. And um, the unit left uh, a week later. Mm -hmm. And a day after they left, I got up on an operating table or I was put on an operating table and mm -hmm. had... Uh, ankle surgery to repair my ankle. Wow. I had, uh, s eight screws and a plate put in, and here I was. I was and and I was all set for this whole deployment, <laughs> and um, they ended up getting someone else to cover for a bit. Mm -hmm. And the and I and I turned to the doctor. I was heart. I be honest. I was heartbroken because mm -hmm. I made that mental shift of being that I was ready to do this deployment and. So in all the stuff you know of my years, here I am. I'm in over 20 years now into the military, and I was never deployed. I, I was, I, I was fully serving that guards, guardsmen reserve, but I wasn't a veteran. Mm -hmm. And that's that. And I could retire from the military and not be considered an official veteran if I yeah, never uh -huh. deployed. And so there was a part of me, and I was all set. I was really ready to do this. Uh, and sure enough. Um, and I remember going in, I said to the doctor, do you think I could still make the deployment if I heal from this? He wasn't sure at the beginning, and I was one of the first questions after I'm up, the ankle he had surgery went well, I said, do you think I can make the deployment? Mm -hmm. And he turned to me and says, I think you can do it. And for the next six months, I said, so in six months from the surgery, you think I can make it? And I did everything that was told for me to do. So the first number of months, because it was a very bad break, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the mission was to do nothing mm -hmm. with my foot up as much as possible and to just let it heal. And for the first two and a half, three months, that's all I did. And then once I was able to start physical therapy, I did every, I, I was the best patient. And six months after the break, I got on a plane to fly to Afghanistan. So February plus six to be so the end of July, <laughs> beginning of August, I started my deployment. Okay. So at that point, I was still actually in the mill. I was considered military. They were sort mm -hmm. of covering me. I was, and not only was I injured, I wasn't working at my synagogue because I couldn't. <laughs> six so, months of doing nothing. Yeah. So my wife uh, joked that although she had she, they said, "Oh, it's great." She, you know, oh, he's home. He didn't have to go. She goes, no, it's harder mm -hmm. because I was ready to be a single parent with two kids, and now I'm a single parent with, with three, three kids, kids. <laughs> and I was the worst. Oh dear! Because <laughs> like just you know, movement and everything. 
So, uh, but sure enough, I got myself in shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through, so now I finally now was coming back on active duty, uh -huh. full active duty. I went down to the uh, uh, CSC, the, uh, uh, it's sort of the processing center for individuals mm -hmm. going into a deployment center that was down at Fort Benning. So I flew down there for the week of training. Um, and I think this is one of the tough things for any soldier or any service member going off is leaving your family. And mm -hmm. I know my kids who, in the end, you know, they, they took it hard when I told them I was going on deployment. Uh, and these are all the things that I've worked with families, what it means to talk to your kids about deployment. So now mm -hmm. I'm going through it myself. But they, they were great that uh, they wanted to see me go to the airport and not, and then they were going to camp. They didn't want me to go to camp mm -hmm. first they, because they didn't want to have the goodbye at camp. And so if mm -hmm. I went to the airport, it was a good goodbye. Uh, they went off to camp. I did my week. And then Sunday, uh, my w wife actually flew down right before I left. We spent Sabbath together down mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And then on a, a Monday morning, I think uh, August, mm -hmm. begin, right in the beginning of August, I can't remember the day, I uh, got on a big plane and we flew to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. In Kuwait, I was there uh, two and a half days. It was a transit center, just waiting for a flight that I was able to get on to fly into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so you fly commercial contract, uh, uh, commercial to Kuwait, and mm -hmm. then it's military from Kuwait into Afghanistan. All right, so now you're in Afghanistan in the middle of summer. Uh, middle of summer. I did actually have this moment. Uh, it was... I've arrived at first in Bagram, Afghanistan. I am mm -hmm. there, and um, it was about three in the morning, and I'm looking out, and you hear jet fighters in the background in the space, and I said, oh my God, I'm in Afghanistan. And uh, I probably said it a little more salty, but... Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I, the next morning, I was able to get to my base, and so yeah, it was quite hot. Mm -hmm. and uh, settled into my room. Uh, my command was happy to see me as part of uh, being a part of, you know, now they had their chaplain to, be, uh, to run things. So, and so for the next six months, I was the brigade command, I was the brigade chaplain, or what's called the task force chaplain from our task force, task force Yankee. Mm -hmm. I was the Kabul based cluster command chaplain which meant that really my main responsibility was to oversee all religious life and the chaplain teams within uh, U.S. bases mm -hmm. in, Af in Kabul area and down in sort of the, the Kabul city area. Not the entire region around Kabul, but mm -hmm. just the Kabul area. Tell uh, us so, what Kabul was like. Uh, it... We, my base, which was Camp Phoenix, mm -hmm. was actually on the outskirts, uh, like in a big industrial park area, so it wasn't the most pretty area. Mm -hmm. So you really got a chance to sing, uh, and I've been to the Middle East here and there, but this was real third world. Um, how people were living. Um, Kabul, downtown Kabul I, has some beautiful areas, but a lot of that area is controlled and walled. But there are some, you know, some beautiful homes and mm -hmm. old cities. Uh, the hills are, that sort of were a ring around Kabul were actually beautiful. Part of the, the Kush area, Lower Himalayans. Mm -hmm. That was actually, when there was a clear day, which was rare, mm. um, and a bit of cold, it was gorgeous, especially when there's mm -hmm. snow on the mountaintops. Mm -hmm. So uh, that part was actually, Kabul is, Afghanistan is beautiful to see from some of the images, but this also has some harsh sites. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting. I mean, there was always a risk when you left the base to go to another base. Uh, it's called being outside the wire, and you had to put on your full battle gear and be an armored vehicle. And you know, as a chaplain, I'm not armed. Mm -hmm. I'm a non-combatant, but I have a chaplain assistant who goes with me. To uh, it was my bodyguard and sort of my assistant. So we would go with other teams to drive to a different base to do Jewish services, to do counseling, checking on things. Sometimes I would go with my commander to go visit sites or different towns in the area. Mm -hmm. So were there any instances where your assistant might have been needed? Uh, 
nothing directly. I was actually mm-hmm. we were traveling out to uh, to see a school that our that the twenty six Yankee the Yankee uh, brigade built. And that was one of the things our commander could do is to build different things in the outside community. And they were doing some incredible work Mm -hmm. on, especially in in like villages around Kabul. Uh, There's a a term called COIN, it's counterinsurgency. And part of that is the idea that if you help the villagers and you teach them real direct things, then they're also going to say, hey, you know, we don't want the Taliban in. We don't want the insurgents to ruin what's going on because we can really better our lives. And... Mm -hmm. The Army is helping us do that, the U.S. Army. So, and our commander, uh, General Hammond, really had this great vision that that's where you'll make a difference. So they were building schools and police stations and community centers and building wells on the outside Mm -hmm. villages where a lot of units were not doing the help. So it was really, they were some great stuff. So we went out to visit a school. And I was in a... uh, uh, MRAP, which is one of the big armored vehicles for traveling out there. I was the la- in the last one. And all these, you see all these kids, like it's like a National Geographic movie coming up towards you and they're mm-hmm. waving and it's exciting. And then I noticed they scattered. Okay, and they keep going, going there. Turns out my vehicle got hit. With the, someone took a shot or whatever and mm. a bullet at the vehicle. So that's how I ended up earning a, what's called a combat action badge, which I don't have it on me, but. Uh, um, um, because our vehicle was hit, we either received or engaged in fire. Um, so it's unusual that chaplains have combat mm-hmm. action badges. But it was one of the things I was hoping not to bring home with me. Yeah. So, but uh, it's an honor to have. So that mm-hmm. was something I received when I was over there uh, as an award. And uh, But to see a village, to see the kids, we would bring school packs that people from like Natick, mm-hmm. The school kids would send over to the military. We would repackage them. And you would have kids receiving school packages of school supplies, pencils, pens, erasers, notebooks, a toy that would be some sweet. And especially in a village, they would never have these items, especially Mm. the girls. Right. And we were building a school that was for both boys and girls. So for me, there was, it was really seen that we were making, I believe, a direct difference Mm -hmm. for these kids. You're bringing up that uh, point of cultural difference which seems to be pervasive in that part of the uh, part of the world. Did you see any other instances of, I mean, were you, did you ever uh, encounter any any kind of uh, the local culture? Um, So a little bit, you know, when you would drive around you would see it and I I still Mm -hmm. have this image the first time I saw Mm -hmm. A burqa, mm-hmm. you know, the garment that, that a religious uh, Afghan women wear. And I really, because you would see them like a national group, you know, on the, in mm. the news or you know, in, in articles. But to actually see one on the street really was quite surprising. You know, it, I it was actually like, wow, mm-hmm. it is real. And I think that was a lot of the images that one may see of what we thought of as Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, to then see it you know, from my own eyes, I think really uh, set quite an impression for me. Um, as far as getting to know the Afghan people, they are lovely. Mm-hmm. Like, I would say like anywhere else you could visit. I mean, they're looking for peace, they're looking to provide for their families. Uh, the Afghans I appreciate were, that I met were greatly appreciative of what the American Army mm-hmm. and what the Americans have done. I mean, everything comes at a price, but I felt when they said America does right, um, there is this one village elder who I heard was Mujahideen, so fighting the Russians way back when, who said to my commander, America is good, Russia was bad. You know, mm-hmm. the Soviets were bad at that point. Mm-hmm. And he said, America was good because they came in and they, they really provided for us. They, they were building a school that he would never have an opportunity to mm-hmm. get a chance to have a school for his village. And now, as he would see it, his, the children, boys and girls, had a real place to learn with real running water. Mm. That's huge. Um, I can't tell you what the future will be for that, Mm -hmm. but I can tell you we made a difference and for that. Uh, Other people that I've met, I mean, there's many Afghan nationals who worked on base. You know, the the person who cut my hair, the person Mm -hmm. that I used to buy things with. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I would have encounters at the dining hall, some of the cooks and people. 
very warm and lovely people, and I got to know them, and it, it was it was special mm -hmm. to be able to have that type of relationship. Just one good example: the guy, the person who used to cut my hair. Um, in Afghanistan, they make something called a naan bread. It's a little mm -hmm. different than like the Indian bread here, but they call it naan. It's this really delicious bread, mm -hmm. and I used to give him some money. He used to get it, you know, fresh made that morning. Oh, wow! <laughs> I used to, it was just delicious. Uh huh. So, well, let's talk about um, some of the personnel you might have dealt with, especially those who might have been deployed three, four, five times. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so one of the important parts that I think is to help with that a chaplain's role, and mm -hmm. my role specifically, is to help with resiliency mm -hmm. of our service members who are on multiple deployments. Um, I believe it does take a great toll on what it means to be there. Now some, I have to say, realized that, and, and there's the, I, they were on their third or fourth deployment because financially it was a good deal for them. Mm -hmm. and for their family. And so, yeah, they recognized the price, but this was a way to help them out. But it was still being a chaplain, they can talk about the struggles and the frustration. Mm -hmm. So that was to help there. Um, one thing that was actually, it was hard, I'll share this one story that, um, one, one of the heart, heartbreaking parts. Mm -hmm. There was, I was called in to work with, uh, it was not our unit, it was a, another unit that was on the base and they had a service member who uh, was really struggling with a lot of issues at home and PTSD and whatever. And they knew he was getting great care here in Afghanistan in a caring command. But there was a lot of issues at home that this service member had to deal with. And so I was brought in as a senior chaplain to sort of give an evaluation and say, yeah, and my view was yes to deal with the issues, the, the service members, it, it's valid for them to go home. So the service member left sort of really the care and support back home, stateside, horrendous stuff to deal with. Uh, and a month later I got word that there was a suicide in the unit back oh, home. No. And it was this personnel person. And um, it was to then help the, the unit back here that did everything right to be able to sort of say goodbye and, and recognize mm -hmm. what happens. Those are the hard things so yeah. that as a chaplain. Uh, again, I'm gonna just say it's being on that sacred ground to mm -hmm. help our service members through challenging times, mm -hmm. whatever they may be. Okay. So six months in Afghanistan? We went, I went through just sort of, a, uh, I was there for the High Holy Days, Jewish mm -hmm. and so to be able to perform Jewish High Holy Day services, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, over there for our service members was great. Uh, uh, I was there for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a funny story. So I keep kosher at Jewish dietary laws. Mm -hmm. And so I can't eat like the turkey and stuff. And they had mm -hmm. all that big stuff for the troops. But I actually found it was a kosher, uh, ready to eat. You just sort of microwave it, um, meal of turkey shawarma. So you know, it's like stay fresh and stuff like yeah, that. Uh -huh. So I cooked it up, so I'm eating with my good friends, Thanksgiving dinner, they're eating the stuff I can't eat, and I'm having my little turkey shawarma and it <laughs> felt good. So, but I was there for Thanksgiving. What exactly was is shawarma? It's like, uh, it's a Middle Eastern sort of turkey on a, I wanna say like a gyro, but it's a little sort of similar to spiced oh, okay. uh -huh. season with Mediterranean season and it sort of cooks up right mm -hmm. in the, so it wasn't bad. <laughs> okay. You have to imagine a lot and it tastes good. <laughs> All right. Um, but I will say that uh, I had the opportunity. I was there for uh, mm -hmm. Hanukkah mm -hmm. and, you know, helping our service members with Christmas. But for Hanukkah, I actually had a five-foot Hanukkah, electric Hanukkah menorah built and lit it on the first night of Hanukkah and throughout. And that was incredible. That was a very important moment for me, what it meant to have, you know, it was cold at night and we were outside and I was serving potato pancakes and mm -hmm. stuff. But we were doing, um, we were celebrating Hanukkah there outside in Afghanistan, which uh -huh. I never thought I would do. Uh, and the next day we actually had a soldier who um, never had a bar mitzvah and we have, I officiated it as a bar mitzvah. No kidding, in, wow. In Kabul. So that was another great moment uh, to take part. And, and that will, the celebrating Hanukkah in Afghanistan will have 
which I'll talk about in a little bit, mm -hmm. another sort of neat uh, component. But uh, I also, as one of the chaplains, uh, had the opportunity to do a memorial service at ISAF, which is the International Security Assistance Force. It's mm -hmm. the main military governing force out of NATO uh, for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And on New Year's Day, I did the memorial service uh, at like 940. And there, that was attended by, um, at that point, um, the senior commander of, uh, of all of ISAF, a four-star general. And uh, so there I am doing the prayer. And uh, it was that was a special moment. Mm. So being there throughout the holidays, and then toward the end of uh, January, right at the beginning of February, uh, we made the, uh, started making the move toward transitioning out and uh, flying back to, uh, you know, leaving Afghanistan. Um, I can't remember the exact days, but mm -hmm. we left maybe right at the beginning of February, mm -hmm. maybe February 2nd, um, or right at the end of January. I can't remember the exact time span, but we flew out of um, Kabul mm -hmm. at night uh, to Kyrgyzstan, Manus Air Force Base. Um, we were there really to pick up our that flight out mm -hmm. back to the States. And uh, we left from then Manus about a day and a half later to fly to Fort Dix where we were out processing. Mm -hmm. And we're there for about a week. And then uh, on a Thursday night, late at night, uh, through an incredible police escort from Connecticut all the way on with all our buses in our unit, we arrived back in Reading at our unit, and that's where I saw my family. Wow. From Connecticut all the way to Reading? Well, we uh -huh. went, well, we, uh -huh. we actually we left New Jersey, mm -hmm. but, uh, so we were about five buses. We made great traffic going around the city, but one of our uh, officers, one of the officers in our unit was also a Connecticut State Trooper. Ah. And then we had some mm -hmm. mass state troopers, and we had various uh, people. Uh, mm -hmm. The Ye the Yankee Brigade has three different sections, and two mm -hmm. of the big sections were an engineering unit and, mil and the other one was military police. So with military police, you have a lot of police officers and state troopers and the like. So when we hit Connecticut, the Connecticut trooper had some of his friends give us escort, you know, through going through the Connecticut turnpikes. Uh -huh. Once we got to Massachusetts, and this is just something of the incredible support of a community. Mm. Once we, we crossed over onto the Mass Pike, all the troopers got out, they were saluting us. Mm -hmm. And then the Mass troopers and all the police officers then picked us up and took us home the rest of the way, shut down all the roads where it needed wow. to be shut, you know, <laughs> so the buses go. And so we made it from New Jersey to Reading in like five and a half hours, which is unbelievable. I'm so. That's almost unheard of. Yeah. Wow. But it was, a lot of it, I have to say these things, it's, uh, and this I think is important. I know doing the work for the veterans and hearing stories, mm -hmm. especially for our Vietnam veterans who struggle with, with what it meant to come home. Mm -hmm. And I know there's, I'm sure there's many stories that you have. Oh, yes, we do. I think what's important for our country is how, in a sense, now the, the great respect and honor, what it means to serve. Mm -hmm. And so here, a community coming out giving support for when units come home. It's not like it was then. And uh, mm. it was a very special, powerful experience. I've seen them as a, you know, watching units come home. Mm -hmm. But now to be a part of that mm -hmm. myself, uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad. Okay. So let's uh, go to a little bit further to around the holidays this time last year. Hanukkah celebrations. So, um, along, so one of the things that happened while I was in Afghanistan, uh -huh. um, then uh, represent, U.S. Representative mm -hmm. uh, Ed Markey, uh, who has been very supportive of veterans in our, in our military force, mm -hmm. uh, one of through some connections arranged through the through the White House uh, White House to have my family go to the uh, the White House Hanukkah celebration. And so my wife and son went. My daughter actually at the point didn't want to go, believe it or not. Uh, mm -hmm. But they went down and they had a chance to meet the President of the United uh -huh. States and the First Lady and uh, met the Vice President. So it was really a great experience. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a year, a year later, uh, 
and I'd been in touch with the director of Jewish outreach at the time. And uh, he called up and he said, can you, or he sent me an email, can you send me your uh, you know, full name, social security number, birthday? I can't tell you what it's for, but it's really good. And I thought I was going to be invited to the, wow, I'll get, a, get to be invited this year. And about a few days later, he calls up and said, Rabbi, um, we would like to honor you with lighting the Hanukkah menorah at the wow. White House celebration. <laughs> and I, it was a great honor. So I had the, I was asked to light it, and I flew down with, uh, I went on orders from the state. The uh -huh. Mass National Guard was very proud that their chaplain was mm -hmm. be doing this. a huge honor. I went down with my daughter, and mm -hmm. uh, I, before the celebration, we got a chance to go down and have sort of a private meeting with the president and the first lady. Mm -hmm. My daughter loved it. They talked about, she and the first lady talked about gymnastics and different things we're doing, and I was uh -huh. talking with the president. And, um, even, and then my daughter went upstairs, and I walked with the president and the first lady to this little elevator. We took an elevator together up to the level, very uh -huh. surreal. And then uh, I was honored with uh, doing the Hanukkah lighting. That's wonderful. So, uh, great honor. So a year, mm -hmm. so, and I really thought the meaning of that a year earlier, that here I was, here I was lighting the Hanukkah menorah in Kabul, and how special it was. And then mm -hmm. never would have dreamed a year later to be lighting it at the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you remember how many people were attending? Or just... uh, there was over five to 600 people at the party. Okay. So. And what was Obama like? Uh, he, the president is very gracious, very mm -hmm. down to earth, um, along with the first lady, very mm -hmm. genuine and real. Mm. Uh, it was a very much a, a great pleasure. Alrighty, so you are now a colonel, mm -hmm. still with the National Guard? Still with the National Guard, and I'm mm -hmm. still the state chaplain for the Massachusetts National Guard. You mentioned uh, in passing a little bit about uh, what might what could be unfolding next year with the drawdown. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, officially, you know that I think <laughs> the best person, the people to speak to, is our public affairs office. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would just say, in general, a ways on our minds, and um, maybe the best way for me to respond is. Whatever the situation it is, uh, going to be important. The role of chaplains to help our service members mm -hmm. deal with the whatever emotions, whatever challenges may arise from it. Mm -hmm. uh, that that commanders across the board and service members and senior uh, non commissioned officers realize the important role of the chaplain corps mm -hmm. to be able to help in the ways that no other place can do. So, um, okay. Well, in your role as a chaplain, as a counselor, what do you think has been um, the biggest challenges facing those who have been deployed and those who are coming home? I'm going to put it in general as resiliency. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to come home after the experiences of what one has witnessed during their deployment of, from Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom now? is how do you deal with it? How do you integrate back, at least as guardsmen mm -hmm. or reservists, how do you integrate back into your society where if a service member comes back to an active duty base, pretty much everyone around them knows, has a general experience. So when your neighbor next to you, the spouse, the kids know what it's like when mom or dad leave. Here in your regular society as guardsmen, you're coming back and it could be that no one on your street has any comprehension of this other world that you live. And that causes, it can easily cause us stress. So mm -hmm. I think we have to address that more, um, how it affects people. Uh, I know in Massachusetts we're doing some great work and have uh, mm. some great community partners around that help service members in their reintegration back into society. And not just for the recent stuff, Vietnam vets mm -hmm. and the like. Um, if I can just highlight a few of them they're doing Go right well. ahead. Uh, one organization called uh, Operation Home Base, which is part of the Red Sox Foundation and uh, Mass General Hospital, uh, having some great things that, that are free, mm -hmm. that for a veteran who is in need can hook up with. And one of the roles then of a chaplain is getting people to say, not just within our own system, to say, hey, there are these other parts that are there for you, that have the confidentiality, mm -hmm. the great help, for you, 
So that's an important part of being for, as a chaplain being able to reach out. Um, you're struggling with, and, and this is a big thing, suicide has been a huge issue. But there is absolute help out there in an organization like uh, Operation Home Base, in uh, uh, UMass Worcester. Uh, some of the great work they're having so that when someone's sort of struggling with issues as a veteran and they come in, the doctors and nurses are aware of that if they're a combat vet, then there are some things they should act and check and not just sort of lump it in, oh, they're just suicidal or whatever. But what is it behind it? Mm -hmm. That's great partnership that I think is happening. And also uh, religious organizations, houses of worship are really saying, what is it that some of our people, our parishioners, are, are, that we need to be aware of that. And churches and synagogues are reaching out to their own. Or so-and-so's grandson mm -hmm. or granddaughter has just been deployed mm -hmm. in another state to have that because this is something that for a while we weren't used to. Um, so I'm excited about that part. But I think one of the neat, one of the roles of the chaplain, see, is to help make those connections and mm -hmm. to say you're not alone. Larry, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? Uh, it, it's been incredible. It's been an important part of who I am. Mm -hmm. I would say it is who I am. I love being a, a rabbi, congregational rabbi, being a part of people's lives from birth to death, from helping families cope from things. Mm -hmm. being a teacher, an educator, a role model for the community, a community leader. But there's this other part of me is being, I, I love being a soldier. Mm -hmm. and, but I love specifically being the soldier chaplain. And so, you know, I talk about, it's not just wearing, this is actually my, what I was, my rank when I was in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, a lieutenant colonel, so now there's an eagle. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's also wearing this, my yep. Jewish chaplain. Mm -hmm. That's very, uh, that I'm a Jewish chaplain and have this, inc this incredible role to influence people and to take, you know, my tradition and 4,000 years of history and learning and study and faith and spirituality and openness and to be able to help other people in their search uh, for God, their journeys of life to make mm -hmm. a difference. So um, I get to... Uh, I sort of joke my Nick, you know, I like to think I'm G.I. Jew. <laughs> so I'm very proud of it. Yeah. I'm very proud to wear the uniform of a United States soldier. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I just, I, I think it's great that, uh, mm -hmm. that you are doing this project and a chance mm -hmm. to collect these stories mm -hmm. and to hopefully be of reference to and help and influence and inspire others in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love, I think it's very important, I think, for all people to serve our country and to feel part of what it means to be mm -hmm. Americans. And I'm, ha I'm honored to do it as, mm -hmm. as a chaplain. Well, Rabbi Lawrence Bazer, we thank you so very much for coming in and taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you so much. Take okay. care. Okay.